Hello and welcome back. So, in this video we will look at this um, technique called batch normalization which uh, helps in uh, training the network a deep neural network better um, and it is kind of conteed of it as a continuation from the data processing pre processing that we saw in the previous lecture. Okay. So, um, what first what is uh, we will look at what is batch normalization and then we will but then we will consider uh, uh, you know what is the problem here when you are training a deep neural network. So, what happens? Okay. So, when we train a deep neural network what happens is that the distribution of each layers input changes during training. We will see why that is in the next slide, but we can see that as we train because the weights keep changing the input to a particular network a particular layer in the network would be changing dynamically. So, because if the weights change drastically between two iterations you have the same issue right and the solution is to somehow um, you know make sure that the distributions do not change too much um, in the sense that the distribution of the inputs to a layer do not change too much. Okay. So, let us see how um, what do you mean by that and how we can address that problem. Okay. Um, so, let us consider this uh, in a slightly more like a functional form let us say. Okay. So, f 1 and f 2 are some transformations. So, what is the transform that occur that happens in a neural network in a layer? So, in a layer what happens you have w transpose x plus v okay. where here x is the input to that layer right this is one transform that happens and you do you pass it through a non linearity. So, then you can get something like e raise to minus um, or x to minus can do something like that. So, that is a transformation that happens right. So, when w changes with every iteration you can see that you know um, the inputs to the particular layer will also dramatically change. So, you can think of f 1 and f 2 as the transformation that happens to your inputs at every layer. Okay. So, if you have two layers in succession each layer characterized by theta uh, by these parameters theta which are nothing but the weights and let us say another layer 2 characterized by this um, other set of weights theta 2 right. So, once if as theta 1 and theta 2 keep changing you can see that the so if theta 1 changes then f 1 will change. So, the input to f 2 changes right sorry the input to f 2 will change and if theta 2 changes then f 2 itself will change again l will change. Okay. So, if you have if L is an input on other layer then L will change in the sense the change is of course, it is expected to happen because we are trying to estimate theta 1 and theta 2 if you think of f 2 and f 1 as uh, as the layers in a deep neural network. But since these changes if they are um, in the sense um, uh, <coughs> this, if these changes are kind of random and large sometimes then you have problems with convergence in a deep neural network. Okay. So, what we do to address this problem in a network is to normalize each activation. Okay. So, this is before we apply the non-linearity typically that is what is done is we can do uh, uh, we have always use x um, just to clarify the notation we always use x to denote the input. In general this is our training data input that is what we, uh, we usually have used x for. So, for the uh, purposes of this video think of x as the input to every layer. Okay. So, every layer has a set of neurons and every neuron has a input coming into it right and what is that input that input coming into every neuron is w transpose x plus b this is the output from previous layer. Okay. So, if there are uh, k neurons in a layer there will be k such terms right k terms or k inputs k terms or k input. So, so this is the input that is coming into a layer and what we do is um, so I have used x pretty much for everything abuse of notation, but then what we do is we do x minus the mean or the expectation value of x divided by the variance of x this is what we saw earlier this is your typical um, z score normalization, but then how do we calculate expectation of x what is this expectation of x. Okay. So, we will just go through the algorithm and then it will be very clear as to what how this mean of x is calculated for every layer. Okay. So, here is the algorithm okay. we are considering um, one layer okay. we are considering one layer. Okay. 
okay. And let us say it has um, k neurons, okay. it has k neurons and we are just trying to see how this batch normalizing transform can be applied to that. Okay. So, if you have k neurons, right? you have this, let us say k is 4, then we have inputs coming in from the previous layer. Right? I am not going to draw it because it gets too confusing. So, multiple inputs coming in from the previous layer um, and then of course, there is this W transpose x, not the, the affine transform that we do, okay, W transpose x plus b. Um, and then followed by nonlinearity that is the output of that particular layer okay that's your activation okay so then once we have that so how do we calculate this so for every neuron if you just take one neuron let's just just take one neuron so we have all these inputs coming to that neuron okay with which we can calculate the linear combination w transpose x plus b And then following, and then you apply the nonlinearity to that, right? That's the output. Now, what uh, what do we mean by calculating the mean of x? So this is one input, okay, to that uh, particular neuron. So what we do is we consider a mini batch of n m training samples. So there are m training samples in a mini batch right and we can when in the forward pass we can actually um, uh, forward pass all the m samples at one what in succession okay and we can compute this w transpose x plus b for each mini batch so if you have m data points then you will have m such um, calculated values for each neuron Okay. So, that is for each activation prior to uh, passing it to the nonlinearity, you will have m such values corresponding to each day each uh, data point in your mini batch. So, this mean is calculated over the mini batch. So, this is for a neuron, right. So, you have a neuron and you have m input data points. This neuron is let us say the first or second layer, and but then when you do the forward pass for a neuron using the weights that have already been estimated. Um, or randomly initialized as you do the forward pass through uh, um, through the network for every uh, every point in that m um, points in that uh, mini uh, mini batch you will have one linear combination okay so you will have m such linear combinations which forms with which you will estimate a mean that is your mean and of course once you subtract that mean out you can estimate the variance squared or the uh, standard deviation square or the mini batch variance and you will normalize every neuron with that every so for uh, for i equal to 1 to m over the or individual uh, input training examples of that mini batch you will calculate this normalized data point okay and once you have done that then we define two parameters gamma and beta again for every so, this if there are 4 of them here, there will be a gamma 1, beta 1, gamma 2, beta 2, gamma 3, beta 3 and gamma 4, beta 4. Okay. So, for every neuron, they will have one hyper, uh, two, two hyper parameters gamma and beta and you will do this transformation. So, how are gamma and beta um, estimated? They are estimated through backprop because all, is, all this is you can think of this as a linear layer in your network and that is how it is. Uh, typically interpreted. So, it up, this linear layer is inserted between your, your um, affine transform which is the linear combination of your um, neuron activation from the previous layer and the, no, and the non-linearity you apply. Okay. So, it is in between these two layers you have uh, you have the uh, batch normalization layer. Okay. So, <coughs> what it does is that so this is a uh, inverse this is a transformation that helps to um, make sure that your uh, data distribution in the sense that the distribution of your uh, activations of your um, that the activation that you compute for every neuron does not shift too drastically. Okay. They are confined to be within a certain distribution. So, when this happens then training is automatically uh, faster and it converges faster. So, you can think of one example where this will work is when one of the w's are too large and 
you know it, it, it leads to it might lead to saturation we saw that we talked about it earlier. So, by doing this normalization you can prevent that from happening also by making sure you can estimate gamma and beta ok. So, you can also see that this is like an in, uh, invertible transformation since it cannot it can, you can gamma and beta can be estimated so that y i can be just equal to x i cap ok that is very easy to see I urge you to convince yourself of that ok. So, if the original calculated value is the one that is actually desirable then gamma and beta can be uh, the network would estimate gamma and beta would to be the inverse of this transformation that we did leading to a um, leading to identity ok. So, if this might sound cryptic, but you should read the paper I will post the paper up there and I urge you to read it ok. So, um, just to recap once again. So, for every neuron in a layer you see that every neuron if this is a fully connected neural network we can think of, uh, that is one we are talking about an MLP. For every neuron in a particular layer it gets inputs from the previous layer ok. We call those we denote those inputs by x ok. So, and we are considering only one neuron at a time. So, for every neuron there is a linear combination of the activations from the previous layer that is that is what we call w transpose x plus b. Now, for when you are during training there is a mini batch of data points m data points. So, we do the forward pass and we calculate this w transpose x plus b for every data point in that mini batch and we do a mean and variance for that for that mini batch for that particular neuron ok. And then we scale the activation of that neuron for a particular data point input data point by the calculated mean and standard deviation ok. And then of course, we multiply it by this gamma, um, gamma and add by beta um, to get a transformed variable. So, this gamma and beta are again estimated by back propagation. So, remember that if there are uh, k neurons in a hidden layer you will have k such parameters. So, it is an addition of k such parameters. Once you have done training, so this is how it is trained. So, for every layer you will have a gamma and beta and it will be estimated once you are training by, by back propagation. Now, once you are done training how do you do the uh, testing and inference. So, then you still need to remember for testing and inference you would still have to for instance you have to calculate this mu and sigma right you have the gamma and beta, but you still have to calculate uh, uh, the uh, mu and sigma. So, what you do is for that you can compute compute mu and sigma over the entire training set for every layer for every neuron ok that is possible. And you have already converged on the appropriate values of gamma and beta for every layer and for every neuron ok. Uh, there are ways of computing mu and sigma as running averages again you can do that as well as you know some exponentially weighted averaging schemes are available, but this is the way to uh, during testing you will calculate mu and sigma for every layer this mu and sigma are for the activations for every layer every neuron in every layer calculate by running it through the entire forward pass data set because that will be added computation or you, or you can just maintain a running average during training. So, each of these are, are fine um, so that is one way of doing it and what are the advantages. So, apparently this uh, the authors of this particular paper comment that um, it uh, it is it improves step it, it increases learning rate. So, you can train with a high learning rate leading to faster convergence because sometimes you have high learning rates and you have large updates and sometimes leading to saturation that would not happen with this because you are uh, doing this um, uh, you, are, you are trying to constrain your uh, activation values to lie within a range typically that is what you are trying to do and that helps ok. Um, it can also help you remove dropouts. So, it acts kind of like a, a the regularization effects of dropout advantages of dropouts apparently are also carried over by this batch normalization ok. Uh, improve stability during training same thing because if you have uh, sometimes your activations can be very large sometimes your weights can become very large uh, leading to you know um, poor training and that can be um, taken care of by this batch normalization ok. The uh, extra computation burden is there because you are adding one more layer between uh, you know extra layer is added uh, before every set of neurons. So, that is a thing. And you need to have significant batch size. So, if you use a batch size of like 1, 2 or 3, some of the large problems they, they require you know, memory constraints might uh, if your data sets large memory constraints might uh, uh, make you choose very small size data sets ok. And in that case that there will be no effect the statistical uh, you know uh, effects are lost by doing that. So, then uh, it is no point doing that at that uh, for those kind of problems where you have very small batch sizes ok reasonably large batch sizes this will work very well ok. 
Um, so, the one question that we have not uh, addressed um, is the convolutional neural network, how do you do this in a convolutional neural network, okay. Um, it is a very interesting question, um, actually the paper addresses that, okay. the paper talks about how to calculate it, um, that will be a homework question, okay. So, now I have given you the homework already. So, for you to read the paper, I will upload the paper soon and uh, read the paper and inside the paper they do comment on how this particular batch normalization can be implemented in a convolutional network. Rem remember that what is being described in this video is how it is implemented for a fully connected neural network, okay. So, um, that is all for batch normalization. So, um, so that is we, we wanted to do these two videos together uh, basically the um, data normalization as well as a batch normalization because I think uh, it will help you understand this better, okay. Thank you.